Building records from the city of Surfside about the Champlain Tower South include detailed documentation of problems at that building. The building was starting its mandated 40-year recertification, and in preparation for that, engineers' inspections and findings identify issues that apparently remained open for the last three years. Rick Slider is a structural engineer and forensic consultant on cases of building construction and efficiencies, and he reviewed those records for us and joins us live here today. Rick, great to have you. Rick, we're glad to see you and glad to have your glad to have your expertise. All right, you've reviewed the documents. You obviously have seen the video. This is your area of expertise. What kind of preliminary conclusions have you reached? Obviously, in the video, it's uh, very dramatic, um, and obviously, it looks like a support condition at one of the lower columns towards the middle of the building. Could be the piling, the support system under the ground, but uh, also could be the uh, lower level columns, at least what it appears to be. And obviously, uh, there are investigators that are going to be conducting their reviews, and we'll be able to determine what the assessment is. Uh, as far as the test, uh, there is a protocol, 40-year recertification, and that uh, requires a structural engineer come out and make an inspection of the building. They're looking at the structural components. It is not required to be destructive, meaning to tear pieces apart, but it's meant to be a visual assessment. But an experienced structural engineer can identify cracks in concrete. Some are important, some aren't. And based upon those uh, observations, they're able to make an assessment as to what needs to be repaired. And as part of the recertification program, the engineer is obligated to come back develop a set of plans and specifications, have contractors qualified in that type work do the repairs, and then implement those and certify that building back to the building department. So Rick, we uh, there in preparation for exactly what you're talking about, there is a body of reports from engineers. Bora Beto Consultants did it out of uh, Palm Beach County from this very building as it prepared to do its recertification. And that report, which I know you read, specify some concerns, uh, some not so serious, some potentially serious, et cetera, all, all over the building. So mechanical, facade roof, electrical, focused on a lot of concrete. And, and even as we are absolutely still in recovery phase, we have been hearing anecdotal evidence, people's reports of what they saw and heard that is beginning to build a body of evidence. And I, I'm going to say as a layperson, I am looking at foundation, concrete, garage area, just based on what I've seen as a layperson. So when you see a report that identifies cracks in the concrete, in the beams, in the garage, in the flooring underneath the pool, which would be the ceiling of the garage, how serious with what you read in that report do you find the reporting of concrete cracks and splits? And we're going to get a little more detailed on that, but just as, a, as an initial question, is that a focus to you? It, it is. Uh, they mention a lot of components on the balconies and the slabs up above. Those aren't, at least for the collapse purposes, aren't as critical. But uh, they do have in the report photographs of fairly significant corrosion of the reinforcing steel and what we call a spall. All that really means is concrete is broken. And the level of concrete that is broken in those slabs is an important factor. That in itself could contribute to um, the issues that we're seeing. And the, the project or the report does mention cracks in the concrete columns. Although the photographs in the uh, report don't really show an extensive amount, it does reflect that the lower level columns in the garage uh, are under structural distress and uh, are exhibiting corrosion and uh, breaking or spilling of the concrete. In fact, we have the photographs you are referring to, in fact, and we want to show people, if we can, some of the photographs that the Morabito consultants uh, prepared and found. And what they show, among other things, is something called concrete spalling. Uh, Rick, explain to us, give us a definition. What, what does spalling mean? Sure. And um, in concrete structures, uh, we also have reinforcing steel. And the reinforcing steel, concrete is fairly durable, um, but the reinforcing steel wants to revert back to the ore, the, the natural material. But it, it rusts if it's exposed to oxygen and moisture uh, and assaults because it's on the beach. And as the steel corrodes, it expands. And when it expands, it pushes on the concrete and causes it to break. And we call that breaking of the concrete a spall. So the real issue that we're looking for in the recertification process is 
how extensive, how pervasive is the amount of corrosion of the steel and how much of the concrete is broken. So it's all spall means is really broken concrete. So in on page seven of this engineer's report, and this is dated October 2018 from an inspection that was done in the summer. So we're exactly three years from the reportings of this particular engineer on this particular building. And with what you just said, I want to throw up a, a screen of what page seven says. Uh, waterproofing below the pool deck and entrance drive, which is near the garage in this building, as well as all of the planter waterproofing is beyond its useful life and therefore all must be completely removed and replaced. The failing waterproofing is causing major structural damage to the concrete structural slab. October 2018 and now in June of 2021. It continues here below these areas. Failure to replace that in the near future will cause the extent of the concrete deterioration to expand exponentially. Rick, that was not repaired. What do you make of that? Yeah, two, two things. And I, I agree with the statement that it, it expands exponentially. The concrete starts, concrete deterioration starts out fairly slow. But as time goes forward, it accelerates quite dramatically. So what may have occurred within the first 10 years could happen within double that amount in the next two years. It, it accelerates dramatically. So that is a factor. Usually, if there are areas of structural distress, and the report and just reading it does suggest that there are areas of structural distress that need it. And I think they, even in the report, it mentions immediate need. And that's typically done within a short period of time after that report is filed. Um, most municipalities would also require that that work be done typically within a year's time. Um, I can't say that I've ever had a project or known of a project that would have waited uh, after reporting of those kind of conditions and waited three years to implement the repairs. So let me just continue. Indulge me for one moment. Here is what people have told me at the scene. Uh, a valet parking attendant said right before the collapse, there was a rush of water, water rushing in. A resident 10 minutes before the collapse who was coming home couldn't get into the garage because it was filling with water and had to back out and leave. These are anecdotal evidence from, from right around the area and people there, what they saw and heard. Residents now report in hindsight rumblings right before. Do any of those anecdotal observations comport with what might be water seeping in and eventually rushing in to cracks that had exponentially gotten worse in the garage. It certainly could. Um, I do also know that there was a, a pool at, uh, I guess it's the southeast area of the building. Uh, it sounded with that much water that's coming in that uh, obviously there's a water source. Could be that the structure was beginning to fail and the cracks in the pool and the pool deck allowed that water to evacuate. Um, there, there could certainly be other factors. I, again, I've not been on the site, um, but those are indications. Once the structure starts moving and allowing water and other elements to come through, it's just telling you that the cracks and the amount of movement in the structure, which it's not supposed to do, uh, is advancing to a point where the failure ultimately happened. We are speaking with Rick Slider, a veteran structural engineer, and we'll be back with more questions for him about the collapse at the Champlain Towers South. Just a minute. Welcome back on this week in South Florida. We are looking at the collapse of the Champlain Tower South, speaking with Rick Slider, veteran structural engineer. Uh, Rick, we know from the Morabito Consulting Report that it warned of major errors in construction design of this building, and the Homeowners Association took that report, and they seem to have acted very slowly. Do you think in some ways, I'm not asking you to prejudge, but... Uh, were they remiss in, in not acting faster? I, I would say based upon the report, there probably should have been a quicker response. Of course, the engineer who conducted the in investigation and issued the report uh, also has a duty to advise their client, in this case, the association, that uh, repairs had to be done. And if there was a safety concern or it reached the level of, of structural distress, uh, that the work should go forward. Yeah. Well, let me follow up and say every city, as you well know, has a building inspector. Did that inspector get a copy of this uh, report on the building? And if so, should he have said, 
gee, they need to act quickly. Uh, as best I know, the records that I have were provided from the building department. Typically, the building departments do rely upon, especially with structural issues, on the representations and uh, engineers have to, what we call sign and seal the document to attest to the validity and the basis for the, the reports. So they would have a right to, and most cases do rely upon a structural engineer. I'm not sure about the timing as to why, if the report was filed in 2018, that actual repairs weren't uh, questioned or implemented prior to that time. Um, but I, I simply don't know what the building department's response was. And as a matter of fact, the roof repair was mm -hmm. part of that, the roof repair that was ongoing that we know now in the last month. The permit for that roof repair was pulled May 17th of this year. Um, and, and because what we were just talking about, this concrete spalling, which goes to the foundation of the building, was one of the problems. The roof, according to the report, had some, some issues, but was generally deemed to be good. Why would the building do the roof work hmm. and other work and not make priority the foundation work before this 40-year research? Yeah, I would, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the reasoning for that. Obviously, if the roof is leaking, uh, that could be an issue and why maybe that was placed before other elements, but the structural concerns should have been done uh, earlier. And especially the, uh, there was one photograph that I recall in the report of the slabs and the amount of uh, concrete spalling that was evident and the exposed reinforcing steel, um, I would certainly have placed or expected those to be placed at the top of the list of the repairs. Uh, not that the roof's not important, but the, obviously the structural issues are important too. All right, so for, for that point, I wanna, on page eight and nine, it seemed like the engineer was raising that flag. And I wanna read something that he wrote about the underside of the pool deck which appears from the photos to be close to the garage uh, where the water was. And he reports previously installed epoxy injection repairs were ineffective in properly repairing existing cracked and spalled concrete slabs. MC recommends, that's the engineer, MC recommends that the entrance pool deck concrete slabs that are showing distress be removed and replaced in their entirety. Unfortunately, he reports, all of these failed slabbed areas are under brick pavers, decorative stamped concrete and planters, which require completed roofing replacement. So he's raising a flag that they weren't put in properly. And then to make it right, there was gonna have to be a lot of cosmetic uplifting to get in to do the foundation mm -hmm. work. Sounds like a huge expense. Also sounds like a life safety issue. What do you say? I think there's a couple of items that are tagged together. One, uh, the reporting and the photograph of the, the top of the slab where the steel is exposed. That's telling you there's structural distress. The other issue is he does report in the report um, the lack of the waterproof and keeping the water out. Uh, that could be a factor. And the fact that they also identified in conjunction with that, that the prior repairs were ineffective and basically didn't work. Uh, and what uh, it appears they did is they tried to inject the material into the cracks from the underside without repairing the top. And that's really ineffective at keeping the water out and it doesn't solve the problem. So all it did is sort of cover over the condition, at least from what I've read in there, all it really did is cover the condition, uh, didn't eliminate it. And again, it allowed it to manifest and, and get worse. Yeah. Uh, Rick, let me ask you a larger question about this recertification process. I happen to live in a condominium shortly a time ago. It went through a 40-year recertification, but my building, you know, is not directly on the ocean. Do you think that, in fact, the recertification for oceanfront properties like Champlain Tower South uh, should occur every 30 years or, you know, not wait 40 years to do it? Uh, that's certainly uh, an item that can be entertained. I would say in my experience and when we are doing these certifications and others that I've seen, usually the observations that are made by the engineer and a qualified engineer is going to be able to assess the level of the cracks. So for the most part, I think the system has worked. What I don't know here, and obviously the uh, engineers on site are going to be able to assess, it could be potentially that there are issues with the foundation or the piling system underneath. And again, that's not visible at the time of the uh, recertification inspections that are done. So basically the, the inspections are done on a, visual observations of those areas that they can see and in areas like the garage, things like that. The only thing they cannot see 
uh, typically would be things under grade, which was going to be the pile foundations. So let me ask a question about the law versus reality, about these 40-year re recertifications. You just mentioned it's a visual, but a visual inspection by a qualified engineer certainly can be very telling. But what in practice, in all of these buildings, what happens when an engineer is contracted to go give the visual, make a report like we have in front of us? What happens realistically when this is handed over to an HOA, Homeowners Association? There's costs involved in this case, a million or more dollars of, of payments through assessments. Uh, there might be building owners who are politically connected, and I just, I am not suggesting any of this happened here, but we do live in South Florida where these mm -hmm. things do documented happen. What happens when this 40-year recertification raises some issues, major or minor, where does that go? Uh, that is an interesting question. I've actually had projects, and it's not uncommon, uh, in occasions the associations may not uh, have reserves or they waived reserves for structural type issues. A lot of these repairs, especially if they get to be a structural standpoint, and like we're talking about with the pavers, the waterproofing, those systems get to be terribly expensive. And um, I've had a number of projects where associations have said, I just don't want to pay it um, and or defer it at some point. Obviously, there's a fine line. The engineer of record obviously needs to say, some of these are structural issues you need to repair. Now you have to do this. And there is an obligation yeah. for his license to identify that to the building permit if that condition exists. Yeah. But uh, I have seen it before where some associations either don't have the funding or don't feel that they have the ability to pay the expense uh, due to assessments or obtaining loans, things like that. Yeah, Rick Snyder, uh, very briefly, there is a forensic structural investigation. So much work needs to be in. And how long do you think it's going to take before there are definitive answers about what caused this collapse? Uh, my guess is there are probably experts already on the site that may have a general sense of where the at least the center point of the condition is, the actual mechanism to it. And some of this, especially my guess is, is on the lower level columns are obviously under the building at this point and potentially if it's a foundation or piling issue. So it may take time for them after they've done their recovery uh, effort to be able to access those areas. And I heard on the press conference that they were, uh, they had a warehouse where they're gonna take the material. So a yeah. forensic engineer is gonna be able to take those elements of the structure, assess them, figure out where they were. Uh, they can tell a lot by how things bend or, or the condition of them, things like that. So uh, my guess is they probably have a sense of where the, the failure occurred or at least started, uh, but to diagnose it and to make their final assessments may take several months, maybe uh, even longer. Yeah several months, maybe even a year, but however it long it takes, it must be done, absolutely. Rick Slider, so great to have your expertise and your analysis that was invaluable, and it thanks was. so much for your time. Thank you, Rick, right. appreciate Thank you. it.